Speaking of random trees, just a short recap uh, on what happened uh, yesterday. Yesterday uh, was about random walks. Uh, we took a random walk, let's say, so you will have uh, 10 minutes without slowly varying functions. Take a uh, a path distribution on the integers, which is downward skip free, which has a heavy tail. We took SN to be uh, <coughs> the associated random walk. Uh, OK, and uh, in this case, if we take alpha to be the minimum between 2 and beta, uh, SN divided by BN, this is the natural scale of SN converged in distribution to a certain random variable y. And bn is of order some constant n to the power uh, 1 over alpha. So just to maybe draw a picture, here is beta greater than 1. Here is beta greater than 2. Here is beta between 1 and 2. Beta uh, at least 2. Okay, that's uh, means that you have a finite variance. So uh, bn is of order square root n. This is just the central limit theorem. And if you look at how evolves the walk after n steps, uh, you will see in the scaling limit something like that. You will see uh, Brownian motion. So. Uh, the height of your walk will be of order square root n. And here, if you look what happens after n steps and you look at the trajectory of the walk, you will have uh, jumps, positive jumps. And uh, here you get, uh, in the scaling limit, a uh, spectrally positive alpha-stable Levy process. And here, the scale is of order n to the power 1 over alpha, which is the same as 1 over beta. So the main difference is be beta, when beta is between 1 and 2, beta is equal to alpha. But when beta goes above 2, alpha does not change. It's equal to 2. And uh, what uh, uh, we saw was a maximal inequality, which allowed us to give a local estimate on the probability that Sn is equal to m with m greater than epsilon n. And we use this local estimate to uh, get a result in total variation concerning the trajectories of the random walk conditioned to be at a high level. So what happens now for the random walk if you take into account the result we saw yesterday? It means that. Here, typically, the random walk arrives at time n at something of order square root n. But you force it to be, instead of uh, arriving maybe uh, somewhere here, you force it to be very high. So what you typically see is under this uh, conditioning, uh, you, you will see something like that, a huge jump, something like that. And here is m of order, let's say, epsilon n. Here is n. There will be a unique big jump, which arrives at a uniform time. Uh, and here, the fluctuations are of order square root n. And if you divide by n, you do not see anything. So unconditioned random walk, you see Brownian motion. If you condition it on going to, let's say, if you condition it to go to uh, zero, you get a Brownian bridge. If you condition it to go at square root n, you get a, a Brownian bridge. But if m is very high, you get a one big jump. And here, under, under the 
uh, this conditioned uh, probability distribution. Here, the, there's a one big <coughs> jump principle as well. And now, uh, the fluctuations here are of order n to the power 1 over beta. Here, when beta ranges between 1 and 2, the magnitude of the fluctuations change, but here the fluctuations are always square root n. Okay. Uh, now maybe uh, just a comment on the maximal inequality. This was the issue raised by Mikhail yesterday. Uh, and just to explain you why this, uh, maybe I, it was a bit fast yesterday, why this cannot hold for every positive x and positive c when in the case beta greater than 2. This cannot hold for every uh, non-negative n, positive and positive x and c. Why? Because uh, Sn is typically of order square root n and mn, the maximum of n variables like this, is of order n to the power 1 over beta. So if uh, this is true, you write probability that Sn is greater than square root n, mn less than 2 n to the power 1 over beta. You apply this, you get C e to the minus square root n divided n to the power 1 over beta with a, maybe a 2. And this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity because uh, uh, beta is greater than 2. Uh, but since Sn is typically of order square root n, Mn is of order n to the power 1 over beta, this in the limit should have positive probability. So this explains why this estimate cannot hold for every uh, positive x and c. And so in the statement, you should really have c at least 1. And indeed, in the proof, uh, you see that if you uh, do not, uh, if c can go to 0, then all the estimates blow up, all the constants blow up. Okay. And, um, the one big jump principle says not only that you see a picture like this, but when you remove this big jump, asymptotically, the small jumps which remain are IID. There's no more conditioning left. And here, the same. Are there questions on this? Yeah, so, but if you, so if, if you think an intermediate scale between the natural scale for one over alpha and between uh, n and one, and so larger with the smaller and then this scale Yeah, so the, the, this is the question of the what is the one big jump domain uh, square root n, if you condition on square root n no big jump you condition on n one big jump where is the transition um, so I think uh, in the Denisov Dicker Schneer uh, paper it's I guess the most general possible results known uh, up to now I think in the finite variance case let's say this one if I remember correctly maybe you can go to square root log n is if in the finite variance case if m, but I'm not, I'm not sure. If you have something like this, then you, you are in the one big jump domain, but uh, I think so. And here, um, uh, 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 I guess if you take uh, n to the power 1 over alpha, as soon as you put n to the power 1 over alpha plus epsilon, then you are in the one big jump, but I'm not sure. I think so. Are there other questions? So if not, now let's apply all this to random trees. In a particular setting, uh, where mu is subcritical, we 
we will denote by m the mean number of children. And we assume <coughs> that uh, mu of n is decaying, is regularly varying, so slowly varying function divided by n to the power 1 plus beta. Okay, and now let Tn be, uh, bien aimé, Galton Watson tree with Osling distribution mu conditioned on having n vertices. The usual, maybe uh, what was known before and which <coughs> we will see uh, in the pictures at the end. Uh, is that in the classical case where mu is a Poisson offspring distribution or a geometric uh, offspring distribution, uh, the scaling limit is connected to the Brownian CRT. So you have a, a fractal-like object, which is not a star, which is not a line, but really something in between. Um, and in this setting, we will see that uh, what happens is that you have your tree which starts growing. It, it, it has a finite spine with geometric length. On the spine, you have some independent trees grafted on it. And at the top of the spine, you have a flower uh, with infinitely many. Uh, uh, here, the, this vertex has uh, a lot, a lot of children. And we'll see that actually it has degree 1 minus n times n. And the goal is to, uh, now I will give you a, a precise result in this statement. And of course, this vertex with maximal degree is connected to the one big jump principle. So I need again my uh, random walk and my scaling constants. I define the associated random walk with this offspring distribution like this. Here, the main difference uh, with uh, yesterday's setting is that the random walk has negative drift. So to apply the results of yesterday, we'll have to add a positive drift to the random walk W so that we can use the results for centered random walks. And let Bn be such that uh, the we have this uh, l uh, central limit theorem. But here, Wn is not centered. So here, I add the drift so that this is a centered random walk. And Bn is the scaling constants. And here, Bn is of order n to the power 1 over alpha with alpha, which is the minimum between 2 and beta. So now just some notation before the theorem. I have to introduce the vertex with maximal degree. <coughs> U star of Tn is the vertex with maximal degree. If there are several vertices with maximal degree, you choose the first one in lexicographical order, say. Um, delta n its degree. delta 2n, the second maximal degree. theorem.
to first. Uh, law of large numbers for the maximal degree. The maximal degree in this tree is of order constant times n. <coughs> so here, okay, maybe I'll... Uh, so this is a result due to Johnson, Stefanson, Johnson, and myself for some parts of it. Uh, okay, so a law of large numbers, central limit theorem. <coughs> and here it's the random variable minus y, which appears. Three. Um, uh, three. Where is the vertex with maximal degree? It converges in distribution without scaling to a geometric random variable. <coughs> so it means that the, the length of the spine has a geometric length in the limit. So condensation occurs, uh, 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 roughly speaking, near the root. And four, uh, here I will be okay. I will be a bit maybe loose. Delta n two is at most here uh, b n, which is n to the power. So maybe I will write it like that. <laughs> Um, is of order n to the power 1 over beta. So here uh, the, uh, the picture is you have a vertex with maximal degree of order n and the next largest degrees are uh, at a polynomial scale uh, which is little o of n because 1 over beta is strictly smaller than 1. Okay, and uh, the height of this vertex of maximal degree converges in distribution. Now I would like to give you the idea of the proof, which using the one big jump principle <coughs> is not uh, very difficult. So idea of proof. The idea is to replace uh, Tn, the bien emigal to Watson tree, condition on having size n, by another tree, which is not the same, but in total variation is close when n goes to infinity. And this other tree is constructed uh, in a very simple way using an unconditioned random walk by the one big jump principle. I'll explain maybe just the idea. If you want the formal proof, you can see the lecture notes. we can replace Tn by another tree whose Lukasiewicz path is the Vervat transform of the path Well, we just take an unconditioned path during n minus 1 steps, and then you add a last jump so that you arrive in minus 1. <coughs> and you use the one big jump principle with the random walk Sn equal Wn plus 1 minus mn by noting that that conditioning on wn equal minus 1 
is conditioning by Sn equal 1 minus m n minus 1. So Wn is a random walk with negative drift. If you condition it to be back at minus 1 at time n, for the centered random walk, it means that you force it at time n to be at a high level comparable of size n. So you can apply the uh, results for the one big jump principle for Sn. So this tells you that for the bridge conditioning, uh, uh, so, okay, so let, I'll do it. Okay. To study Tn, you code it by the, the Lukasiewicz path. The Lukasiewicz path of Tn is the Verva transform of the, the bridge version. So you say, okay, what is the bridge version when n goes to infinity? You have one big jump somewhere. You have a one big jump somewhere. When you forget this one big jump, you get asymptotically iid increments. So these are the iid increments. And by exchangeability, I just put this huge jump at the end. Here I'm putting a thing under the carpet. Anyway, so what is uh, Tn? How is obtained Tn? You just take your random walk. It has a negative drift, so at time n minus 1, it, be, it will be around 1 minus m times n. And then you force it at time n to be at time, maybe I'll do something like that. You force it to be here. Okay, this thing is this thing. And this minus one is here. You do the verva transform of this path. What do you get? I mean, you have here two parts. Here you have the first time your infimum is reached. So when you do the verva transform, you will start reading things here. The verva transform of this is <coughs> something like that. You start by doing this. Then you make the huge big jump. And then you have this part, which is here. So what I'm saying is to show this result, it is enough to show the result when you replace Tn by another tree whose Lukasiewicz path is obtained just by looking at your random walk up to time n minus 1, adding a new point here, doing the Verva transform. So in particular, this is very simple to simulate because there is no conditioning. You just run your random walk at one point, do the Verva transform. Of course, it's not an exact simulation, but in the limit when n goes to infinity, uh, the error you make tends to 0. And this is very convenient because you see immediately that the largest degree of this new tree is the maximal jump. And what is the maximal jump? By construction, it's just uh, minus 1 minus the sum of the increments up to time n minus 1. And by construction, the increments before time n minus 1 are iid. So uh, essentially, you, the, to prove this, you just have to work on iid random variables, which is rather easy. So you see that the maximal uh, degree here, uh, you maybe have to add 1 or minus 1 because the jumps in the Lukasiewicz paths are, in the, are number of children minus 1. So the max degree of Tn is uh, minus 1, uh, minus x1 plus x and minus 1, plus or minus 1, let's say. And you immediately get 1 and 2, because 1 and 2 is just, 1 is uh, law of large numbers for this, 2 is central limit theorem for this, and these are uh, IID random variables. <coughs> so 
and 4 as well. What is the second maximum degree? Well, it's uh, the maximum of the xi's up to time n minus 1. So you have n minus 1 ID random variables with a heavy tail. You compute uh, uh, the uh, cumulative distribution function, and you see that uh, it's of order n to the power 1 over beta. And uh, f 3 is a bit more uh, trickier. Yes? Um, <coughs> uh, so I think if beta is between uh, uh, 1 and 2, uh, it's w yeah, I, I think it's always n to the power 1 over beta. Because of our, I think, uh, because of our regularity assumption, and so uh, if you take uh, if you take uh, n copies of this and you look uh, how big is the maximum, yeah. it will be of order this, no? And then no, uh, no fully, not fully equation. Ah, yeah, 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 always, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, up to uh, of order, uh, slowly varying fun yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so I should have been precise. Uh, uh, up to a slowly varying function. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I should be precise. When I mean of order, do I mean up to a constant or up to a solely varying function? Yeah, here it's up to a solely varying function. If you put here, if uh, asymptotic like this, then you have no slowly, slowly varying function. Yeah, thank you. Are there other questions? So for 3, here we have to understand the height of a vertex. And here the idea is to use a connection between uh, height of vertices and the Lukasiewicz path. Actually, just by looking at the Lukasiewicz path, uh, you can uh, get information on heights of vertices. So maybe on an example, if you have this tree, I order the vertices in lexicographical order. <coughs> I look at the associated Lukasiewicz path. I make three children a jump of size 2, minus 1, 2, minus 1, 0, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. Now, if I want to look at the height, for example, of u4, what you do is that you look u4, you look here, and then you go down here. When you go, go down here, you go left here, and you look when you go here from right to left, you look at the weak ladder times you get by going down. So here we have one weak ladder time here because this one goes up, but I look the weak ladder times down, and here I have a second one. Two zero. Two zero. Okay, actually, the weak ladder times, downward weak ladder times when you go from right to left in the Lukasiewicz path, uh, actually by sort of construction, correspond precisely to the vertices which are ancestors of your vertex. So what I'm saying is that the height of UK is just the number of times strictly before K such that the Lukasiewicz path at time I is equal to the minimum over time I K of the Lukasiewicz path. <laughs> so
So this means that to find the height of the vertex with maximal degree, what do you have to do? You have the vertex with maximal degree is here. So what you should do, you should start here, read from right to left, and count how many weak downward ladder times you have. Okay. And what is this number of weak ladder times you have? Well, by uh, the construction of the Verva transform, you just look at your unconditioned path. You start at time n minus 1, and you go from right to left. In other words, you look at the time-reversed random walk, and you count how many uh, weak ladder times, downward weak ladder times you have. And you can continue, because here, by, uh, con by definition of this point, you will have no more weak ladder times here, because everything which is here is above. Okay. So what I'm saying is that the height of the vertex with maximal degree in this modified tree is, uh, I'll try to make it right with the uh, time reversed random walk, is the number of times the time reversed random walk at time n minus 1 uh, is equal to the maximum over time is 0. <coughs> where wn minus 1 k is just wn minus 1 minus w n minus 1 minus k. This is the same time reversed random walk as in the exercises. It's just a random walk you look, uh, you get when you put your, ha your head down and you read the jumps backwards. So you just look at your random walk. No, this way. And indeed, weak la downward ladder times from right to left for this original random walk, when you do uh, this time reversal, you get uh, upward weak ladder times. But your random walk has the same distribution uh, as uh, the time reverse random walk because you just read the jumps in a different order. And what is this? So what I this is, you, you do your random walk. It has a negative drift, and you count the number of total number of weak ladder times. Since this uh, random walk has a negative drift, you know that the number of weak ladder times is almost surely finite. So you already know that this quantity converges in distribution. And how can you compute this law? Well, uh, okay, you start from zero. Either you make a weak ladder time or not. What is the probability you do not make a weak ladder time? It's the probability that your random walk uh, stays below minus one forever. And this is a probability we computed in exercise three uh, yesterday, two days ago. And, w and each time you do a weak ladder time uh, by the strong Markov property, uh, with the same probability, either you will have a new weak ladder time or not. So you see that by the strong Markov property, you get a geometric distribution. And the parameter is a con explicit. Converges when n goes to infinity to a geometric random variable uh, by the strong Markov property. Strong Markov property. And uh, <coughs> the parameter is the probability. So the parameter, 1 minus the parameter, which was computed in exercise 3. So once you use the one big jump principle with this a bit of tricky construction of the modified tree, everything is very easy.
Yes? They only care about property one and three. Does this hold for a general heavy tail thing, not without uh, assumptions of uh, having beta, uh, beta decay with slowly varying functions? Uh, wha what assumption do you have in mind? Well, uh, I don't know, just uh, having. For example, if you, if you have uh, the, the, the power does not uh, go to infinity, I mean, you, you can define an asymptotic power. Ah, you mean, okay. Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, okay, so you mean... Uh, so the question is, uh, okay, we have this rather strong... this was the main assumption so the question is you mean for example uh, you say mu of n is smaller than c to uh, something like that do you mean something like that or uh, yeah uh, so I uh, um, I'm not sure so I guess this is too weak because uh, larger yeah okay um, yeah uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, it's unclear. Um, here, you really uh, all the uh, local results uh, really use uh, this very strong regularity assumption. So I don't know. Even if you want, uh, now assume that the tail just assume that you have this for the tail. Does the same results hold? Uh, this uh, is unknown. Essentially, uh, we have a local conditioning. So uh, if we have a local conditioning, this local assumption is very useful. But we do, in general, we do not know how to treat a local conditioning without just an assumption on the tail um, to study the global geometry of the tree. So what happens if you change this by this? So this is... Um, Unclear. But if you make this tail assumption and you make the tail conditioning, you condition having size at least n, then uh, the same works. But uh, if you have local conditioning tail assumption, uh, this, is, uh, this is unknown. Are there other questions? So if not, let's uh, can do a bit of uh, pictures and movies. So now the goal is to uh, uh, explain you more generally uh, what is known in the limits of uh, large Bianimi Galton Watson trees. What happens if you are not subcritical? Uh, what happens if you are critical? Do you have scaling limits? Do you have local limits? This is a bit of overview. So the questions uh, we investigated for these uh, large trees falls more generally in the framework of studying limits of large random discrete structures. So I'm going to give you uh, uh, maybe a bit of motivation. I guess uh, Justin motivated you already, but uh, again, even more motivation. Uh, let's say you have a set of combinatorial objects of size n, which can be your permutations, partitions, graph functions, walks, and so on. And your goal is to study uh, the set for large n. <coughs> uh, first question in the domain of maybe combinatorics is just to enumerate uh, this uh, set. Usually there are different ways of doing it, by but typically there are bijective methods generating functions. 
But then you can ask, OK, the number of elements in the set can be very large. The set of all trees with n vertices with n large is large. But what does a typical element inside look like? Uh, the, the possibilities are, are huge, but are there some which are more typical than others? For example, if you take a large tree with n vertices uniformly at random, will it be like a star or will it be like a long line? Or Typically, what will it look like? And to uh, th define a bit things, you can just say, OK, I take a random variable, which is uh, uniformly distributed on the set, and you want to uh, say something about it. You can study uh, some statistics on XN, but what uh, the message I would like you um, I would like to convey is to, to study these discrete objects. A uh, way of doing it is to show that actually you have a limiting object. So we already uh, saw this in uh, Justin's uh, lecture. So uh, why? Imagine you have a sequence of discrete objects converging to a limiting object x. So here I'm being very vague. So this can be useful for uh, several reasons. First, you can actually study the limiting object from the discrete. If a certain property is satisfied by the discrete world and passes through the limit, for free you get that the continuous or the limiting object satisfies it. Then you can go from the continuous world to the discrete world. If a certain property is satisfied by the limiting object passes through the limit, then in some sense for n large enough in some sense, uh, xn, roughly speaking, uh, satisfies this property. And then you can use this uh, very powerful universality phenomenon. Say you want to study <coughs> yn. Yn is very complicated. So to study yn, a possibility is to show that yn converges to x. To find other discrete objects, xn, which converge to x, show that xn satisfies p, get that x satisfies p, then go back to yn and show that yn satisfies p. So it seems a bit complicated, but uh, in many applications this is very useful because for uh, microscopic combinatorial reasons, yn can be very complicated to study. But if you change it a little bit, you change the model, but sometimes just by changing it a bit, the model for combinatorial reasons becomes uh, very simpler to study. And to show convergence, sometimes you do not really need to know this uh, very uh, uh, a microscopic structure uh, may be connected with P. And actually what we did for the condensation part was to do uh, something like that. We, we did not have a limiting object. We'll see that actually in the condensation case there is no limiting object. <coughs> but what we did was to study Yn, this conditioned random walk. Uh, we approximated it by a non-conditioned random walk and we showed properties for Xn. <coughs> so, okay, convergence in what sense? <coughs> Our objects always live in uh, metric spaces which are polished, complete separable, which are nice to do probability. And when the objects are random, uh, we will always speak of convergence in distribution for random variables taking values in the same space. They are not necessarily defined on the same probability space, but what is important is that all, they all live in the same space, the uh, discrete object and the limiting one. Uh, so now I'd like to give you first some models which are not trees, which are coded by trees. And in these models, uh, using uh, information on the asymptotic behavior of random trees, you get uh, non-trivial information concerning these models. So just wa wa want to show you some pictures. Then I will review what is known concerning local limits of Bianemi Galton Watson trees and then scaling limits of Bianemi Galton Watson trees. So some models. So here are just uh, pictures and bijections. So actually the logo of uh, 
uh, of the workshop. So this is a random map with uh, percolation on the vertices and the loops are percolation clusters. So here is one percolation cluster and uh, this if you just look at the boundary of the percolation cluster you can code it by a, a two type tree. Okay, so now that you are very motivated uh, let's uh, uh, turn to the study and uh, historical overview of what is known on local limits. So recall that we are working with Biennemi Galton Watson trees with an osmotic distribution mu. You start from one ancestor, the root, and everyone has a number of children distributed according to mu. And what does it look like? So here we take the framework of local limits, not exactly a weak local limits in the sense that we do not sample the, the root uniformly at random. We are, uh, uh, by definition, our trees are rooted so we do not change the root. We take Tn to be very large and we look uh, what can be said about the finite neighborhoods of the root. You do not resample the root uniform at random. So here is the a result. So maybe I ha should add Grimmett and... Uh, uh, I don't remember, uh, Grimmett. Kennedy. Kennedy, yeah. <laughs> Kolmogorov. Okay, uh, so let mu be a critical offspring distribution. Very general, so the only assumption is uh, critical. No uh, uh, regularity assumption at all. Let Tn be a uh, Bienem Galton Watson tree condition having n vertices. And then you always have convergence for the local topology. Kessen, I guess, uh, took a particular offspring distribution. The conditioning was a bit different. And this, in this very general version, I think this is due to Janssen and Abraham Delmas. So what happens is that you have a limit, which is an infinite tree, locally finite. Every vertex has a finite degree, but you have an infinite spine. And on the spine are grafted independent copies of your trees. And the construction goes as follows. You start with the root, uh, which is special. Uh, if you are special, the probability that you have i children is a size bias distribution, i mu of i, which is indeed a probability because mu is critical. If you, sp you are special, you uh, get a number of children with this probability. Then you select uniform at random one of your children which is special, the other or normal, or not so, not so special, I don't know. Anyway, and then you graft uh, uh, independent uh, trees on it, and then you continue. So the spine always continues because for i equals zero, this is zero. So on the, if you are special, you always have at least one child. And so on. So you construct this infinite tree, and this result tells you that for the local topology, you have uh, this convergence in distribution. It means that if you look at the neighborhood uh, of size 100 of your root and you uh, make uh, n go to infinity, what you will see will be roughly speaking for n very large the same as if you start with this infinite tree and you cut it uh, uh, at generation 100. And this convergence is useful when you uh, evaluate for uh, once you have this abstract convergence, you can evalu evaluate it on continuous functionals for this uh, uh, topology. So you can use this abstract convergence to get information on Tn. But this uh, uh, statistics, uh, these functions you apply, have to be continuous with respect to the local topology. So what information can you get, for example? What is a local, a local information you can get on Tn? So for example, the degree of the root, uh, to know the degree of the root, you only need a ball of size two. So this tells you for free that the degree of the root of Tn converges in distribution to this random variable. 
For example, if you look at the rightmost path, the length of the rightmost path, actually, uh, this will also work. Because the length of the rightmost path, you can check that it's almost surely finite. Are there questions on this? And again, the only assumption is criticality. Now, subcritical case. Assume that you are subcritical, that the radius of convergence is 1. So we already encountered this condition. This means that you cannot exponentially tilt your offspring distribution to increase the mean. Then you also have a convergence in distribution for the local topology. But now, your uh, tree has a finite spine. On the top of the spine, you have a vertex with infinite degree grafted on top. There are infinitely many IID random trees. So here you have to tweak a bit the definition of local topology uh, because here you have a vertex of infinite degree. And previously, uh, we were working with locally finite trees. But you can still uh, make sense of this. Are well, there are questions on this? And again, uh, there's no uh, regularity assumptions on mu or on the tail of mu. So this tells you, in some sense, that in Tn, close to the root, you will have a vertex whose uh, degree is growing uh, to infinity. But it does not tell you what is the maximum degree of, uh, of the tree, because this is non-local. Uh, how many, uh, what are the, yeah, what is the maximum degree, the second uh, maximum degree, and so on. And, uh, <coughs> and you, can ca <coughs> you can construct weird examples. For example, uh, Swante Janssen has given an example of a subcritical offspring distribution, which is very lacunary. And along one subsequence, let's say even n, you have one vertex of degree n over 2. And if n is odd, you have two vertices of degree of order n over 3. But this does not contradict this picture. In some sense, the vertex, one of the vertices with maximal degree, you can identify it with this one. And the other ones, if they exist, they just go to infinity. Their height tends to infinity. You do not see them in the local limit. So this does not tell you anything about the global picture. But uh, the advantage is that uh, you have really no uh, regularity assumptions. This is very general. And if we want uh, global results concerning the whole geometry of the tree, uh, we have to impose regularity assumptions. So scaling limits. Uh, now what does a large random tree look like globally? So here is a simulation of a large random critical uh, Biennemi Galton Watson tree. You see that it's not a star, it's not a line, it's really something in between. Some sort of stru uh, fractal structure emerges. And to give a precise quantitative result in this direction, in order to get uh, a result, uh, a very nice tool to give a sense, a precise sense of the notion of convergence of trees is to code them by functions and to look at the convergence of the associated functions, because we have many uh, functional spaces uh, in which we can study convergence. Um, we already saw the Lukasiewicz path, which codes a tree. But the disadvantage of the Lukasiewicz path is that if I give you the Lukasiewicz path, it's not uh, very simple to see the geometry of the tree. If I give you the Lukasiewicz path and I ask you what is the total height of the tree, uh, it's not uh, that uh, easy to, to see. And you, by using the contour function, which is another coding, uh, it will be rather easy. So to define the contour function, you need your favorite animal. Uh, you put it on the root, then you dress your animal to do the contour of the tree at unit speed. Uh, and your in your tree, every branch has length one. And you look at the height of your animal as time goes. So my favorite animal is the capybara is a huge rat and uh, but uh, but which purrs if you rub its belly okay <laughs> okay so you you get your tree and the contour function and this is uh, very nice 
because if you have the contour function, uh, you can uh, reconstruct the tree just by viewing the contour function as a strip of paper by putting glue under it and doing like that. So now I can give precise results concerning the scaling limit of the contour functions associated with trees. First, critical uh, offspring distribution finite variance. Uh, and this result is due to Aldous in the beginning of the 90s. He showed that the contour function scaled in time by a factor 2n in space by a factor square root n converges to a multiple of the Brownian excursion, which looks something like that, which is informally Brownian motion conditioned to be positive and to return at zero at time one. The square root n factor is not that surprising. It comes from the central limit theorem. This factor 2n in uh, time is not that surprising neither, because if you have n vertices, uh, you have n minus 1 edges. The contour function visits each edge, each edge twice. So 2n is roughly speaking the time you need to do the contour of the tree. And uh, this is an abstract convergence in a functional space. And you can evaluate this abstract convergence through functionals which are continuous with respect to the topology of uniform convergence, such as the supremum. So for free, by evaluating this at the supremum and by uh, noting that the supremum of the contour function is the height of the tree, get for free uh, that your, the height of your tree is of order square root n. And if you, uh, and if you uh, write things like that, you converge to the probability that the supremum of the Brownian excursion exceeds level a which is a nice theta Jacobi function, or theta function, Jacobi function, I don't remember. And, and this computation, you can do it directly in the continuous world um, uh, using uh, excursion theory. So it's rather nice because to study the discrete world, uh, you use the continuous world, but you don't know, does the continuous world exist or not? You don't care. Okay, you just do computations. And, uh, and this is uh, historically, uh, it's also a, a bit nice, I think it was in the 60s or the 70s. Um, on the one hand, this function appeared as the tail of the supremum of the Brownian excursion. And on the other hand, in the combinatorial probability community, people looked at the height of, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, uniform label trees. And by using uh, analytic combinatorial tools, they obtained this convergence. And at that time, it wasn't clear, well, is this just a coincidence? Uh, the fact that this quantity appears as a limit and also as this tail of the supremum of the Brownian excursion. And uh, thanks to Aldous, uh, actually the answer was it's not a coincidence and it's really something more deep behind. It's really not just the supremum of the Brownian excursion which is behind, but really the whole Brownian excursion which governs the geometry of, of large trees. <coughs> and the idea of the proof uh, is to use the Lukasiewicz path. The advantage of the contour function is that uh, you get the tree very easily from it, but the disadvantage is that in general it's not a random walk. Uh, it's not Markovian anymore. The advantage of the Lukasiewicz path is that uh, it's a sort of random walk, but uh, the disadvantage is that uh, the geometry of the tree is less clear to grasp uh, by just looking at it. So you first obtain a uh, scaling limit of the Lukasiewicz path. So this is a conditioned version of the Donsker invariance principle convergence of rescaled random walks to Brownian motion. And then you go from the Lukasiewicz path to the contour function. Actually in the geometric case, geometric one half case, this is the only case where the contour function is a sort of random walk. So in the geometric one half case, if you want uniform plane trees, this is a bit easier because you just can work with the contour function. <coughs> Are there questions on this? Now if you relax, uh, no. Now, okay, we have convergence of functions, but can we say that really the trees converge? And the idea is that you can say yes, if you view trees in an appropriate space, which uh, turns out to be the space of all compact metric spaces up to isometry. Uh, and you can indeed view a finite tree as a compact metric space, 
uh, it's a finite matrix space, um, the points are the vertices, and the distance is just the graph distance. So you get a finite matrix space which is compact, and you can define a very nice notion of distance uh, on compact metric spaces. You can measure how far two abstract compact metric spaces are apart. And the idea uh, is first to say that you can measure how far are two subsets of the same metric space by using the Hausdorff distance. If you have two sets, you look at the you neighborhoods of the first one, uh, neighborhoods of the second one, and you take the smallest enlargement such that uh, the one contains the other and the other contains the one. Okay, and now if you have two abstract compact metric spaces, you can define a distance between them by embedding them in the same space. So it's a huge infimum. It's the smallest, smallest Hausdorff distance between all possible isometric embeddings of X and Y in the same metric space. So you take the infimum over all metric spaces Z over all embeddings and so on. And this indeed defines a distance on the set of all compact metric spaces up to isometry. And uh, a rather easy consequence of Aldous's theorem is that uh, you get that if you scale distances in the compact metric space Tn by square root n, you have convergence in distribution in the space of compact metric spaces up to isometry keep equipped with the Grom of Hausdorff distance to a limiting compact metric space, which is the Brownian CRT, which roughly speaking is the compact metric space obtained from the Brownian excursion by just uh, gluing it uh, like that. So here I'm being a bit vague, but this is just to convey the main ideas. And the reason uh, of this is just that the function which associates uh, to a contour function, its associated compact metric space is continuous. So uh, this here is just a corollary of the convergence of contour functions. So this is for uh, plane trees. Uh, and uh, there, there has been, uh, of course, a lot of uh, work after the Aldous to try to get co abstract convergences like this for non-plane objects, which you cannot directly code by contour functions. So Benedict Stufler worked, uh, uh, had a, a lot of results in this direction. Uh, and, uh, and the difficulty of this uh, non-plane case is that you have symmetries. Uh, you have a, no more uh, simple coding functions and so on. Okay, so now what happens in the infinite variance case? Assume that now you are, for the moment, still critical that you have a heavy tail. If you like slowly varying functions, you can add one. Now take a large random tree. What does it look like? Here is a picture for alpha equals 1.1. 1.5, 1.9. So you see that you still have a fractal structure, but you have hubs, okay. uh, ver vertices with large degrees. And uh, you see that here when alpha decreases, this whole thing increases. So when alpha increases, you tend to have uh, more and more children, which explains why for small alpha, uh, you see uh, larger degrees. And formally, you can show that you also have a scaling limit, but distances will not be of order square root n anymore. They will be uh, of order n to some power, which is now 1 minus 1 over alpha. And uh, the limiting tree is not coded by Brownian motion anymore, but by uh, a continuous proce uh, process in continuous time, but which has jumps which is indexed by uh, uh, spectrally positive Levy processes. Here I'm going a bit fast. Okay. Now, uh, what happened in the subcritical case? We, we already saw, and this was the goal of the lectures, that you can have condensation. Uh, so let me recall you what we saw. We take a subcritical Oswing distribution uh, here, uh, we assume that it has a heavy tail. You can add slowly varying functions if you want. And here is a, a picture. You have a vertex with maximal degree. The root is somewhere. 
And we saw that there is a unique vertex of degree of order n up to a constant. Uh, the other degrees are actually of order n to the power uh, 1 over beta. And the height of the vertex with maximal degree converges in distribution. And it is also possible to show actually that the height of Tn is of order log n because it just looks like a finite spine on which are grafted, roughly speaking, n iid uh, subcritical Bialimi Galton Watson trees for which the tail of the height decays exponentially fast. And there are no non trivial scaling limits. If you scale by something too large, you get uh, uh, just one point in the limit. If you do not scale enough, your uh, thing is not bounded, but if you scale at the order log n, there is no non-trivial scaling limit for the gromov hausdorff topology. Because on the vertex with maximal degree, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of, of tentacles emerging. Uh, okay, and just to say that in this case, we are subcritical, the radius of convergence is one, so we can also apply the results concerning the local convergence and ask, uh, okay, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is this compatible? Is it uh, in, in intuitively, or, or are the pictures the same or not? So recall that in the subcritical case, radius of convergence equal to one, you converge to a condensation tree, which has a finite spine. And on top, there are infinitely many trees. So here the local picture coincides with the global picture. Here the vertex with maximal degree will actually uh, converge, uh, its height converges in distribution. So indeed, in this local limit, this vertex with maximal degree coincides with uh, this one. So the, 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 the two pictures uh, coincide. Now I would like to uh, uh, end by mentioning uh, another case which is rather interesting because condensation occurs in the critical case. And this is the critical Cauchy case, alpha equal to one, which was always excluded until now. So you take a critical offspring distribution and you assume that the probability of having i children is of order L of i over i square. And here, uh, you really uh, have to live with slowly varying functions because if you put a constant here, uh, the mean is infinite. So if you want to treat alpha equal one, you really have to have a slowly varying function. For example, one over log i square, which uh, has a finite mean. So here is a picture. It seems that you have condensation, but you also have uh, other hubs which seems to be smaller, but still they exist. So here, this is a, a recent result we obtained with Loïc Richier, is that actually the maximal degree is not of order n as before, but n over a slowly varying function which tends to infinity. So condensa condensation occurs, but at a smaller scale. And the maximum of the other degrees is not n to some power with the power less than one, it's still n over another slowly varying function, but which is uh, uh, larger. This thing has to be larger than this one, so I guess L2 has to be larger than L1. L2, so yeah, okay. And here, the height of the vertex with maximal degree uh, does not converge in distribution to a geometric random variable. Its height uh, converges in probability to infinity. So, um, what happens is that you can say, okay, here we are critical, so we can apply the local convergence results. Uh, the local limit is this infinite tree with an infinite spine. So, ah, but we have condensation, how is this possible? Well, the reason is that it is possible because the height of the vertex with maximal degree, uh, its height tends in probability to infinity. So it escapes to infinity and you do not see it in the local limit. And for example, if you take mu of i of order one over log i square i square, then the maximal degrees of order n over log n, the maximum of the other degrees are of order n over log n square, and the height of the vertex with maximal degree is of order log n. And if you change the slowly varying function here, you have to change the slowly varying function here, you have to change the slowly varying function here. But in this case, everything uh, can be computed explicitly. 
Yes. Uh, yes, yes, it will be all, uh, it's, like, uh, it's like in the uh, subcritical case, we had a uh, first maximal degree of order n, the other ones were n to the power 1 over beta, and this n to the power 1 over beta, actually it's, uh, it's just, if you look at the scaling limit, it's just the jumps of the non-conditioned process, and you have infinitely many jumps of this order. And so here the same happens, you have one degree of order n over L1 of n, and actually, uh, infinitely many degrees of this order, which uh, corresponds to jumps of, this, of the Cauchy process. Are there other questions on, on this? So if not, just to recap, for scaling limits, mu is critical finite variance, distances are of order square root n, the scaling limit is a CRT, critical infinite variance domain of attraction of a stable law, distances are of order, sorry, here it's 1 minus 1 over alpha. The scaling limit is the alpha stable tree. Uh, our uh, object of interest for these lectures, subcritical case, regular, local regularity assumption. And as I mentioned, it is open to understand what happens if you replace this local assumption by this tail assumption. Then we have condensation. And in the critical case, Cauchy case, we have condensation but at a, at a smaller scale. Okay, so that's all. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>